What's up, everybody? The great thing about making hour-long videos about an amazing and complicated TV show is that the nature of this work makes it sort of perpetuate itself. I turn over more and more stones, find more and more details, but always come up short, always miss things, and there's always more to say and more connections to make. Sometimes my delightful and beautiful subscribers call me out and draw my attention to something I missed, but other times I realize it myself right after publishing a new video. Like the whole wolves versus sheep idea. We talked in part 4 about how Better Call Saul makes us question our assumptions about human nature and how the show challenges us to work out whether characters are acting from who they are or from who they've learned to be. And we asked how we know the difference. But did we really go into depth about this if I neglected relevant details from the first half of this amazing final season? Season 6 makes us ask not just whether wolves and sheep are a coherent binary to understand people with, but also, even if this binary did exist, are Kim and Jimmy the same type? Are they both wolves? Are either of them wolves? Did they start wolves or change into wolves? And given all this, what is it like for them to experience the consequences of changes in their relationship and changes in themselves? For an explicit insight into this, we really need to look at the second episode of the final season, which is called Carrot and Stick. This episode shows Kim and Jimmy devising a plan to lie to the Kettlemans about a possibility for Craig to be exonerated for his past crimes by filing a civil suit accusing HHM of ineffective counsel. Jimmy plants the idea in their head that Howard was addicted to cocaine while representing them two years earlier, and then the Kettlemans take the bait, taking Jimmy's quote-unquote information and bringing it to reputable law firms like Davis and Maine, which Jimmy and Kim knew they would do, thereby getting the lie to Clifford Maine without it coming directly from Jimmy or Kim's mouth. Cliff obviously doesn't pursue the case for multiple reasons, which is what Jimmy and Kim want because the case has no merit. They've just used the Kettlemans for what they needed them for, but the only problem is they need the Kettlemans to never tell anyone about their influence. The title of this episode comes from Jimmy and Kim disagreeing about whether positive reinforcement, a carrot, or negative reinforcement, a stick, is more effective in manipulating the Kettlemans to stay quiet. Jimmy is on Team Carrot. He wants to bribe them with money, partially because he thinks it will work well, and partially because the stick is maybe a bit intense for him. <sighs> the stick, yeah, well, it's a big stick. It's huge. The stick is threatening to expose the Kettlemans for continuing to commit fraud with their tax preparation business. Kim isn't convinced by Jimmy's advocacy for the carrot method, and we immediately see her ask to go with him to their business the next day. Or, ask is the wrong word. I think maybe I'll come too. Kim is progressing her involvement from mastermind to actual in-person participant, and this is significant because it's her showing more and more interest in prioritizing her life outside the law. It's also very significant that she goes to the Kettlemans out of a lack of trust in Jimmy's ability to get the job done. The next morning, we see Jimmy's bribery fail as Kim lurks in the background like a real intimidating accomplice. She's so intense and interesting in this scene because of how she straddles the line between injustice and justice. She's there to intimidate them and to keep and quiet about the scam she came up with, of course, but she does so by threatening to report them for genuinely terrible behavior the Kettlemans have been engaging in by ripping off all their clients. So it's a little bit hard to see her and Jimmy as purely unethical. I asked my kind and generous YouTube subscribers whether they thought Kim and Jimmy have been acting purely ethically, sort of ethically, sort of unethically, or purely unethically, and we had a great voter turnout, so we can really say that the vast majority of people consider Kim and Jimmy's behavior purely unethical. However, hundreds of people don't see it that way. Quite a few don't see it as generally unethical, even. It's a nuanced thing. Back in the scene we're talking about, Kim's stick method consists of her calling her friend at the IRS on speakerphone and describing the scheme the Kettlemans are up to, giving information bit by bit until Betsy can't handle it and hangs up the phone. Kim drives the threat home. You think you've lost everything? You have no idea. It gives me chills. And it caught Jimmy a bit off guard. It's hard for him to see the Kettlemans on the verge of tears, probably in part because he sympathizes with their compulsion to scam people, but also importantly because the show wants us to question whether Jimmy might just be a little bit more sensitive than Kim. Despite what we discussed in part 3 about Kim usually having a harder time pushing down feelings than Jimmy, that's not the case anymore, certainly not when it comes to feelings of guilt about the plan. In fact, he's so much softer than Kim that when he 
leaves the Kettleman's business a minute after her, she immediately correctly guesses that he gave them the bribe money anyways. He doesn't respond, and at that point the goal of silencing them had surely been accomplished with Kim's stick approach, so the money he gave them isn't even a carrot, honestly, because it's really not necessary to achieving the goal. The money is instead almost like an apology, like Jimmy making some sort of futile gesture of amends, or to put it more accurately, pacifying his conscience a bit. They get in the car and the next thing he says is this. Wolves and sheep. Huh? Nothing. Now, what does this moment mean? He's frustrated at this point with the stress of this early stage in their multifaceted long-term scam. So is he saying wolves and sheep under his breath to reassure himself? To reinforce to himself that what they're doing is right? That they're the wolves and they're just doing what they need to do to the sheep? It makes a bit of sense because they really have dominated and gone wolf mode on the Kettlemans. But no, he must not be calling them the sheep because that would make no sense as a direct response to Kim calling him out for giving them the money. I mean, it could make a little sense if you figure that him giving them the money is pitying them like a wolf pitying a sheep, but I don't think this really adds up. And not just because so-called wolves don't pity so-called sheep, but because of the larger context of the show. Instead, something about all this makes me think that he's calling himself the sheep and Kim the wolf. This is what it seems like to me from his tone and from the fact that Kim just accomplished what he couldn't with his carrot method. Is this why he doesn't repeat it when she doesn't hear him? Because it was just just a throwaway admission meant to supplement the need for any vulnerable conversation or actual reflection like we talked about a lot in part 3. Let's dig into why he might call Kim a wolf at this point, and the first thing to notice is that he said it in a way that seems frustrated and unhappy. Wolves and sheep. Huh? Nothing. He's frustrated by the whole Kettleman situation that just occurred, which made him feel ineffective and inferior, feelings of shame I don't think he's good at handling. And I think he's also mad at himself in a guilty way for letting their relationship get to the point where Kim is more hardcore than him. Let's take a look at how Better Call Saul shows Jimmy seeing changes in Kim and how it could be that he might have come to see himself as a sheep and Kim as a wolf. A lot of Jimmy's perception of the way Kim changes centers around him noticing changes in how she responds to his behavior. In this season 6 situation with him giving money to the Kettlemans, it's like some weird form of charity, right? And though the context of it makes it clearly not a strictly ethical thing, it's pseudo-ethical because it gives him the impression he's helping others. Kim clearly looks down on Jimmy for doing it, of course, so Jimmy is in this case seeing her negative response to him trying to do what he sees as a good or ethical thing. And this is the analog of how he also comes to see Kim responding more and more positively to him doing bad or unethical things. I'll start by saying part of me wishes Jimmy was referring to the Kettlemans as sheep because there would be something really cute and funny about that, as the Kettlemans are absolute scammers. This is what makes Kim and Jimmy's journey so interesting is that they're the wolves to other wolves. They scam the scammers. This aspect of the show makes me think that what we're really led to see is how socially constructed the categories of wolves and sheep really are. Like what if it actually does make sense to talk about people as being either wolves or sheep, but the real mistake is thinking that these are natural categories based on someone's personality or genes rather than social constructions built from their experiences and position in society. Hmm, I wonder if anyone's ever found helpful ways to describe the history of society as a history of struggle between two kinds or classes of people. Hmm, the bourgeois wolves and the sheepetariat maybe? I don't know. But the fact that Kim and Jimmy scam scammers lets them avoid simply thinking of themselves as aggressive predators. Another way they tamp down their conscience and maintain some sense of identity is by finding ethical needles in the unethical haystack. Like they're doing this whole Howard scam while telling themselves that they're helping finally bring to a close the multi-million dollar class action lawsuit that will pay out to all the senior folks at the wolf-like sandpiper elder care facility. But they get their money now while well, they can still use it. And the lawyers get paid. Of course, they know that they're primarily doing their scam to get themselves money. They're not so much in denial that they can't admit this to themselves and each other. And the thing is, we're led to believe that Howard and HHM are sort of milking the case and dragging it out in a greedy way for the biggest possible settlement. With the very low quota of morality Jimmy and Kim require to justify their actions, they carry out this plan that's clearly deeply meaningful to them on a personal level. We see Kim and Jimmy's post-coital pillow talk plotting at the end of season 5 
alive. And if you haven't rewatched these scenes since the events of season six, let me tell you, it is a chilling experience. They're hiding out at a hotel after Lalo showed up to their apartment that first time, and they finally calm down by joking back and forth about ways of humiliating Howard. But first, let's start by looking at the conversation that leads into this, which is where Kim confronts Jimmy about Howard having told her that Jimmy threw a bowling ball through his car window and tried to embarrass him by having sex workers show up to Howard's lunch and stuff like that. Or, I say confront, but Kim's not really confronting him much. You think it's a confrontation when you're watching it at first, and Jimmy certainly does, but it becomes clear that Kim has nothing against the behaviors. Instead, she wants to express to Jimmy how absurd and insulting she felt it was for Howard to tell her these things out of concern for her. And sure, I can see that Howard had a patronizing, paternalistic way of doing it. He wasn't as effective a communicator as he could have been. Maybe it was hard for him to be perfectly rational communicating about his relationship with Jimmy. In the pathos building scene in season six of Howard at home with his wife Cheryl, we get the sense that Jimmy's terror campaign against him had been a source of stress in their marriage. That's not over with. Hmm. I think it's getting worse. This is not the face of someone who has any confidence in what's being said to them. Howard was doing his best to present a strong front, but they seem to have not had a super close relationship, and while a harassment campaign by an ex-employee might not cause new problems in a relationship, it's certainly going to exacerbate any existing ones. I think Cheryl doesn't see Howard as strong here because she just wishes he wasn't involved with Jimmy at all. It's sort of a victim-blaming attitude she has, and it's kind of messed up that she can't support him, but what are you going to do? I guess it's not that much of a problem anymore. All this is to say there are a lot of reasons why Howard might get a little activated telling Kim about what her husband's done to him. After he crosses a line by insinuating that Kim's not making her own decisions, she laughs in his face and tells him how insulting he's been. Which he has been, so she's right to say that, but it's clear that she's amplifying her indignation to avoid focusing on the allegations, and also because I'm sure she's defensive and insecure about just how much Jimmy may have come to influence her life decisions. But she's not just defensive and insulted, she tells him explicitly that she doesn't believe him. Howard, I know Jimmy, and you're wrong. We know for a fact that Kim is acting here, since when she brings it up to Jimmy back at the hotel, she clearly believes he did it, she just doesn't care. If she's even the slightest bit upset, it's because he didn't tell her. But he explains it was before they made their marriage pact to tell each other everything from then on. So she immediately moves on to what she's interested in, expressing her feelings about Howard's condescension. <sighs> Like, I'm just waiting for him to ride up on his white horse. I'm really intrigued by this scene because Kim goes on to talk about how selfish and full of himself she thinks Howard is, saying he was acting all superior, but it seems to me that this is really just that she came out of that confrontation feeling inferior, and so she's blaming him for her justified feeling of guilt about not caring much whether Jimmy harassed Howard. Like, Howard was condescending and insulted her sense of agency, yes, but I think it's obvious that he cares about her well-being in a genuine way, at least far, far more than she cares about his. And you could say that they don't have an obligation to care about each other's well-being, but I think deep down we're all social creatures and we want to care about each other. So Kim, instead of interrogating why she has so little empathy for Howard, finds it much easier to blame him for how their interaction made her feel. She felt inferior because Howard, with his knowing smile, perceived her lack of principles, so she felt exposed and judged. Where a more principled and less vindictive person might be introspective and self-critical in a situation like this, Kim is not disposed or incentivized to be this way. Instead of being mad at Jimmy's most absurdly immature and antisocial behavior, she says, He needed to be taken down a peg. Now we're back on the subject we mentioned earlier, of Jimmy perceiving changes in Kim through the changes in how she responds to his behavior. He's clearly uncomfortable here, because he's thinking, hey, I feel like she should be a little more upset to hear I smashed someone's car with a bowling ball. Instead, as we noted, they move on to bonding about different ideas of how to continue to torment Howard, semi-jokingly at first. It's an old gag, but, um, sneak into his country club and put Nair in his shampoo bottle. Then he takes a shower and... <sighs> What a foreshadow, since they do of course end up using the idea to sneak into his country club, but instead they do it to plant cocaine in Howard's locker as the necessary first step in their plan. Kim is laughing at first too, it's just fun and games. And sex. Better Call Saul is subtle about a lot of things, but one thing it's not subtle about is the direct relationship between Kim and Jimmy's scamming and their erotic life. There's this legendary shot from the most recent episode where they get turned on by the success of their plan of drugging and further humiliating 
King Howard. As their plan climaxes, so do they. And back to the season 5 finale hotel scene, we see this transition as they fantasize about plots and schemes. <laughs> or, or, or we break into his house. I'm sure I speak for others when I say this is a deeply unsettling aspect of their relationship, the way it thrives on the thrill of manipulation. Their fun in games is always inherently not fun in games for others, and Jimmy has passed the torch of scamming to Kim so much over the last few years that she fully caught fire. This causes her to burn her more ethical and pro-social opportunities, even when the parts of herself that want to pursue those opportunities are very likely still there deep down. For example, we agonize in this final season as we see Kim whip her car around from driving to an important opportunity for her public defense work, all because Jimmy called her with an emergency issue in their scam rollout. Let's say a bit more about this point, because obviously morally Jimmy should not have called her, right? It's a nearly impossible ask to expect her to continue with her presentation knowing that their long-term scam is in jeopardy on its final day. It's true that she could have hypothetically decided to continue on and try to block out the awareness that their plan could be coming to nothing but that's an extremely difficult thing to do, so by calling her, Jimmy heavily incentivizes her to give up on her good goal. She comes back all because she knows how to properly make what looks like a cast on the arm of the actor they're using since she was in that car accident previously, but frankly, I have a hard time believing Jimmy couldn't find anyone else who could wrap a convincing-looking cast. He tries to be the voice of reason when she shows up, but it's too late, and since he called her, it feels completely hollow to me. Here, give me the bag, you get back in the car, bust the speed limit, and you You'll still make that lunch. Jimmy, this is where I need to be. I'm sure he's genuinely frustrated on some level because he has some awareness that she's fooling herself, but his sigh seems forced and mainly meant to placate his own conscience by giving himself plausible deniability about his influence on Kim. I hope it's clear that we are talking about Jimmy's negative influence on Kim without taking agency away from Kim, just like we could talk about artists influencing one another without taking away from the creativity of either one's work. By the way, I might make the next video in this series all about Jimmy the Rock star Jimmy the artist because I think that's a really interesting aspect of the show and his character so subscribe for that but anyway I think with Kim and Jimmy what we see is a complicated back and forth influence where they have impacted each other in the process of fulfilling needs in themselves and each other for years as a side note I was thinking about how it's fun to wonder what the characters Kim and Jimmy would say if we could somehow contact them and ask in private whether they feel like they've had a positive impact on the other if they somehow trusted the person and asking enough to really try to give an honest answer, what would they say? I really don't know. All I have is the opinion that this is such an incredibly hard thing to imagine because it's so hard to imagine them having an intimate and vulnerable conversation where they express healthy self-criticism. And I think that says a lot about both their characters and their love. But here are the two main metrics that I think people should consider if they're trying to ask themselves about their influence on another person. First, there's harm reduction. Influencing someone to be healthier or to make decisions that are less destructive and more sustainable long term. Like Kim after the famous Hoboken Squat Cobbler situation trying to influence Jimmy to not put his law license on the line so precariously. Or Jimmy trying to influence Kim to take the Schweikart and Coakley partner track position when Kim was offered it. These were positive pro-social ways they acted towards each other's personal life and it's notable that these were very much towards the start of their relationship. The second metric is helping someone become more themselves and reach their own goals, regardless of harm reduction or sustainability considerations. Now, these two different types of positive influence are of course not fully different. In fact, they're very much intertwined as we can understand that helping someone live out their identity more and reach their own goals is in many situations going to make them feel better and can even make their life more sustainable. And helping someone live in a more healthy and sustainable way can also help them live in line with their own identity and goals. Ideally, health-wise, there should be a huge amount of overlap, and a big part of motivational interviewing and other therapeutic modalities is helping people find this overlap so they can feel motivated to do healthy behaviors for reasons other than because they're healthy. We're not always great in our lives at stimulating the right motivations of each other. We're not always skilled in using our words like a tool to help others discover incentives. It's something we can improve on if we try, but in general, people quite often make mistakes in how they go about influencing others. 
This is why we need more professional influencers. Just kidding. My point is that for us to feel confident in how we're influencing others, we need to know so much more than just what it means to be a responsible, healthy adult. We need to have a solid understanding of who the other person is, who they want to be, what their goals are, and what the obstacles are to them meeting their goals, among a bunch of other stuff. It's notable that in season two, Kim apologized for influencing Jimmy to take the Davis and Maine job, implying that she worried her positive influence of the health type got in the way of her supporting him being and becoming himself. He knew what you wanted, but I got in the way. He reassures her that he wanted to make the responsible choice and he wants the life improvements that come with it. And we know this is true because we saw him five episodes earlier realize how aimless and empty he felt floating in the pool and decide to call Davis and Maine to finally set up the interview. Though Kim was worried that she influenced him to be too responsible at the risk of him being himself, I don't think we've ever seen Jimmy worry about this with Kim. Instead, we most certainly have seen him worry about influencing Kim to be less responsible. Like when he asked her, Am I bad for you? I know there are viewers of the show who answer a simple and emphatic yes to him asking that, but if Kim doesn't, then Jimmy can at most be half bad for her, if we think about the metrics of influence we were talking about. He might be bad for her health and sustainability, but he's not bad for her personal interests, and I don't just mean her passions and hobbies, I mean her deep physiological and attachment-based needs, things that are hard to even put into words without writing poetry. I want to touch on a few quick points about the season 2 stuff we were just talking about. The season 2 premiere is the one where Jimmy decides he's unfulfilled, floating around, and goes for the Davis and Main job, and we see him get his fancy new office, but he's clearly not satisfied. He's not just unsatisfied, he's ambiguously satisfied, and we see him flip-flop in and out of discomfort. First, he says this to the employee orienting him to the new office. Omar, I'm pretty low maintenance. But then, not even 10 seconds later, he asks, Do, do we get a choice of desks? and he chooses an absurdly expensive type of desk. I don't even know whether it's right to say he's doing this out of selfishness, it's just that he genuinely doesn't know how to motivate himself, and he figures, hey, maybe I can incentivize myself to actually give this place a shot if I feel like a fancy big boy with a nice desk. I mean, we saw the gaudy mansion he seems to have eventually scammed his way into based on the flash forward that started this final season, so we know that the guy thinks that a gold toilet can quiet his conscience. The season two premiere episode is called Switch, because of this moment at the end of it where he flips a light switch just because it has a note saying don't flip it. Like a child motivated beyond reason to just test a boundary, he can't resist. It's the first thing he does in his new office, spite the non-human authority of this symbolic sticker on the light switch. After pausing for a few beats of his silent rebellion, he quickly flips the switch back to its beginning position, deciding he trusts the authority of the sticker. And I think this is symbolic of where he's at at the beginning of the second season. He's willing to attempt to adhere to principles or to play by the rules. He genuinely does give Davis and Maine a try. I mean, he does a horrible job eventually with the commercial release and all, but I think we'll get into that in the next video. Anyway, with this Switch episode, it's the same one where he and Kim hook up for the first time in the real-time timeline of the show, which they do, of course, after bonding deeply by wolfing a wolf for the first time together. The morning after, Jimmy starts to remember that real life exists, and before the day ends, he's out of the pool and into a fancy office requesting Coco bolo for his desk. I think the real switch that's been flipped in this episode was the way Kim was so turned on by the scamming they did, and that's not in any way to take away from her agency and decision making, because it's because of who she is that she was as receptive as she was to Jimmy's way of producing adrenaline and other hormones. That's the invisible switch that's been flipped, I think, and we will see whether it's possible for it to be flipped back. What will happen to Kim? I know we all want to know. I mentioned this on stream because, by the way, I stream on YouTube now, and as streamers do, I was going on about this random thought I had. Is there a chance that Kim ends up folding to the police? Is that an impossible idea? My intelligent family member pointed out that this seems very unlikely given this advice Kim gives to Jimmy in season six. Do you want to be a friend of the cartel, or do you want to be a rat?
But we have to wonder whether she's still of this perspective after the trauma of witnessing what happened to Howard and knowing how much of the responsibility she holds for that. Also, she was the one approached directly and in private by the prosecuting attorney and it would be the ultimate twist for her to turn herself in in a season that's seen Kim grow so calculating and conscienceless. But it really is hard to imagine her being self-sacrificing to this degree. Would she really somehow manifest such an amount of guilt that it would make her act completely against her self-interest purely on principle? Actually, will it even be against her self-interest at a certain point? I don't know. It is true that despite how she acts most of the time lately, there are definitely pangs of conscience. Like, listen to the way she responds when Jimmy quotes a Bible verse to try to imply that she shouldn't be paranoid about being followed. Well, you know what they say, the wicked flee when no man pursueth. You think we're wicked? Jimmy resolves this situation in the corniest possible way by saying she's wicked hot, which is just an abominable approach to conversation. The lengths he will go to to not introspect are really amazing. <laughs> she lets it happen too. She doesn't want to think any harder than he does. And of course, Kim was being followed, so maybe Jimmy should have given it a few seconds of thought and shouldn't have disregarded her experience for a cheap interpretation of a Bible quote and a joke. She eventually learns that she's being followed from Mike when she and him meet for the first time, outside of the court parking lot, of course. Mike communicates to her that she's being watched because Lalo is alive and Mike's trying to locate him, and when Kim asks why he's telling her instead of Jimmy, he says, Because I think you're made of sterner stuff. There's something cool I found online where people pointed out that Mike is quoting a line from a speech by Mark Antony at Julius Caesar's funeral in Shakespeare's play about that whole situation. Antony is defending Caesar from Brutus, who had just killed him, and then given a speech about how he killed Caesar for being too ambitious. Wow, and people still think cancel culture is a thing nowadays, huh? So after Brutus brutally canceled Caesar, Antony captivates the plebeians with a moving speech, in which he defends Caesar by saying, When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. So Mike's basically saying Kim has more ambition than Caesar, or really that she has the ability to block out compassion and fully justify the means by the end. Mike heard her speak up to Lalo and defend Jimmy that time at the apartment, and he knows that Jimmy is irrational and emotional. He's inconsistent. When I say that Mike is quoting the play, I mean there's a good chance he literally was because Mike had actually referenced Caesar before on the show, when he was beginning his monologue to Stacy about the corrupt he engaged in as a cop. It's like killing Caesar. Everyone's guilty. Now, Shakespeare is very cool, but without reading this play or really understanding that much about Caesar and ancient Rome, I still get that Mike is talking about basically how group dynamics affect decision making when corruption is incentivized as a survival mechanism. On a related note, but more about the show than about Mike as a character, I also noted that Jimmy is from Cicero, Illinois, and Cicero was also a Roman politician who was killed by Mark Antony after Caesar's death. I really don't know what exactly to make of all this, okay? I'm not going to try to speculate too much, but I just don't think it's all a coincidence. Let me know what you think. What's interesting also about the situation where Mike tells Kim she's made of sterner stuff is that it's one of those classic comments that are so thick with nature versus nurture meaning. It's just an interesting feature of language, I think, that phrases about being made of sterner stuff can be interpreted as either being very much about genetics, heritability, and dispositions, or instead can be understood as being about behaviors, habits, and conscious self-control. On this note, we saw Howard describe the difference between the stuff Kim and Jimmy are made of. In fact, it was one of the last things he did. Jimmy, you can't help yourself. Chuck knew it. You were born that way. But you, one of the smartest and most promising human beings I've ever known. And this is the life you choose. See, by this point, Howard has no problem understanding Kim's agency, and in fact, he detests her for it. The idea of Kim choosing this life is not contradictory to the idea that she's made of sterner stuff, by the way, I don't think, but it's this progression from reined-in stuff to unleashed sterner stuff that's so interesting. To jump back to season two again briefly, we talked about Kim and Jimmy first hooking up during the season premiere, and then what happens is just a few episodes later, he gets himself into serious trouble at Davison 
in Maine, causing Kim to get in trouble at HHM for guilt by association. This leads to them being out of touch for a bit. Jimmy calls her every day and leaves songs on her voicemail, then they reconnect in the sixth episode of the season as Kim gets the offer from Schweikart and Coakley and calls him to hang out. They meet up, scam someone, and hook up, basically replaying the situation from the season premiere. Their morning after scene this time includes that line we looked at where Kim apologizes for influencing Jimmy to take the Davis and Maine job. And honestly, what I hadn't really realized enough until writing this script is that what she's doing here is taking accountability away from Jimmy about the whole commercial fiasco at Davis and Maine. It's as if she's saying that she was wrong to get him that job because he couldn't help it but act out when he didn't really fit in. The scene ends with Jimmy giving Kim a pep talk about how she should take the job at Schweikart, which we talked about earlier, but there's this great line where they have this exchange about Kim's opportunity. What's not to love about that? Yeah. What's not to love? This is the direct analog to the season premiere situation where Jimmy was influenced by their first hookup to make a responsible and pro-social decision. But just like with Jimmy flipping the switch and sort of having a hard time adjusting to Davis and Maine, it's clear that Kim's saying what's not to love without fully believing it. And this is another situation where we can see their self-understanding and communication skills lacking them. Because a more emotionally mature couple would actually try to answer this question, what's not to love, instead of considering it a palliative, reassuring thought. A more self-aware Kim would try to dig into what was actually missing for her about a position like this, and this might lead to a more self-aware Jimmy actually acknowledging the ways he's unfulfilled by his Davis and Maine job, but I don't know how well they want to know themselves. I think insofar as there exists something called the self, it requires a relatively stable set of values such that behaviors can be explained by their roots in the individual's identity rather than simply being shifting reactions to stimuli. Neither Kim nor Jimmy have a stable set of values. They're too much smitten with the opportunism of the wolves and sheep ideology. They've ignored other people's humanity so many times that they can't identify their own. Without stable values or a stable sense of self, how are they supposed to understand themselves and each other and communicate to each other the reasoning behind their needs? Everything is always in motion, and their needs have shifted as their identities have shifted. What's shifted especially especially are their consciences. Conscienci? Consciences? I'm a big believer in the idea that almost everyone has a conscience, and most people who act like they don't have just found ways to incentivize their conscience to stay really, really quiet. But we don't exist in isolation, and neither do our perspectives, so someone who wants to keep their conscience quiet has to spend time around other people who will co-sign their unethical behavior. If the people closest to them try to stop co-signing their unethical behavior, they get subjected to manipulation and pressure, as the wrongdoer acts out to try to make others mirror their own low conscience intensity. Back at the hotel at the end of season 5, we see Jimmy try to resuscitate his and Kim's consciences when he voices his argument in response to her, while she keeps just coming back to these ideas of humiliating Howard and ties it directly to the Sandpiper settlement. At the end of it, he might never be able to practice law again. He doesn't deserve that. And who knows if we could pull it off. Kim gives him this look, and Jimmy immediately laughs and says, okay, they could pull it off. And while I think it's safe to say that they're mostly motivated by the huge amount of money, I would guess that at least 30% of their motivation for this whole scam is just to prove to themselves that they can pull it off and get away with it. Not sure about how that's gonna go. But a more clear point is that part of why Jimmy fails to resuscitate any consciences is that he immediately moves from the moral argument of Howard not deserving harm to the practical and more ego-involved conversation about whether they could carry it out. This is the classic error of considering can I instead of should I, and as I say, you can only have one first priority, so if Jimmy really cared to prioritize the moral considerations of their behaviors, he missed that boat about a thousand times. I think it's precisely the wolf mentality that forgets about should in favor of can. Because if you think about it like someone who believes themselves a wolf along the lines of this philosophy, what separates a wolf from the sheep. 
Whether it's a natural disposition or a set of skills and a perspective, one thing that's true, I think, is that a wolf would say that anyone would be a wolf if they could be. This is because they see it as a can difference, not a should difference. They don't view themselves as having a moral failing, they just think morality isn't what matters. I thought about this when I reflected on what a world of all wolves would be like. A human society where everyone plays the role of the wolf. And my brain immediately had the reaction of, well wait, isn't that the kind of society a wolf would say that we live in? A society without a social contract, a wild west of ethics? Personally, I don't believe that everyone would be a wolf if they could. My experience has taught me that many people with power still willingly do mostly pro-social behaviors. So when I ask what a society of all wolves would be like, my next thought is, well, that would be a chaos hellscape, right? But at the end of the day, I don't think the thought experiment actually makes any sense, because a wolf wolf, by being a wolf, creates sheep. Or you could say sheep need to exist first, I don't know, it probably works both ways. The point is that a wolf can't be a wolf without there being sheep. And arguably a sheep can't be a sheep without there being wolves. Maybe that expression, there's a sucker born every minute, doesn't refer to little sheeple babies literally being born, but instead to adults or people of any age being quote unquote born by being turned into a sheep by another person's corruption. I'm not saying it's this way only, but I think the evidence supports a more dynamic view of the world and of social and economic roles. So of course they decide to carry out Kim's plan, it becomes their plan, which leads us all the way back to our discussion about Jimmy saying wolves and sheep huh nothing his angry tone and the way he peels out with his car after saying wolves and sheep reminds me of little Jimmy's frustrated face he made at the end of the original wolves and sheep scene, right after he takes the scammer guy's philosophy to heart and steals money from his parents' business, as we of course talked about in the previous video. When Jimmy turns down the volume on his conscience, he does it begrudgingly. He's pissed off that he feels the need to carry out his schemes. We saw a similar expression when he was deciding to sabotage Chuck's court filing. His conscience speaks but it gets drowned out. A slightly cheesy way of putting my opinion would be to say that Jimmy has a heart of gold and a very social way about him, but he's learned this philosophy that values selfishness and he doesn't have the ability to challenge it. Because he's very confused about his own motivations, he has a hard time understanding other people's. We talked in the last video about when Howard visited the hospital where Chuck was and Jimmy just fabricated a whole wolf-like motivation he accused Howard of. And we could also look at how part of Jimmy and Kim's problem is that Jimmy Jimmy doesn't truly understand either side of Kim, the sheep side that wants to work as a public defender or the ruthless wolf side that wants to destroy Howard's career. In his mind, a wolf idea that's not his wolf idea is suspicious because he has better moral skills when he can see the decision from the outside. Still, a sense of right and wrong is only one piece. The ability to let the conscience assert itself is a much more broad set of skills. Skills Jimmy never needed to learn because even with the benefit fit of distance, he's biased towards self-interest that borders on self-destruction. So even if he's disturbed by the way Kim represents a sort of reflection of his own actions, he's still primarily interested in losing himself in the powerful feeling of scamming. It's significant that season 6 shows Jimmy and Kim scamming the Kettleman, since they were an integral part of the start of the series. From the first episode on, we get so much of Jimmy's character development through his interactions with them, or at least we do if we're part of the beloved few who have watched this whole show without seeing Breaking Bad. By the way, thank you everybody for your feedback about that. Your many varied and sometimes contradicting recommendations have really been appreciated. I'm processing all that information and I'm giving some deep thought to my media consumption habits. Who knows, maybe I'll eventually watch all the shows you recommended and make videos about them. Don't hold me to it though. Anyway, when we first met the Kettlemans, they were this big dorky fish of a client that Jimmy was trying to catch as they looked for for a lawyer to defend Craig from the charges about the fraud he committed as county treasurer. There is such a full circle element to how they come back in season 6. In the first episode of the series, Jimmy tries and fails to get the Kettlemans to sign a letter of engagement for his services, and then finally in season 6 he gets them to sign one as part of the whole Howard scam. You remember these? I made some updates, just closed a few loopholes and whatnot. Even the pen click comes full circle. First in season 1, episode 1, it's like this. 
And then, of course, Betsy stops Craig from signing. And by the way, there's this absolutely absurd and definitely unintentional thing that I noticed and I have to mention, which is that both these scenes take place right around the 17 and a half minute mark in each episode. So make of that what you will, all you amateur numerologists. Anyway, in the season six situation, Jimmy walks away when they reject his offer, and we hear the Kettleman stressfully bicker, with Craig now apparently desperate enough, after his time in prison, I guess, to insist and disagree, and Betsy now desperate enough to give in. Noticeably, Jimmy is vastly more confident now than when two years earlier his overeager smile was probably the final tip-off to Betsy to not trust him. Here, he's willing to confidently walk away, and the pen click comes like this. Mr. Goodman? The click doesn't have any echo this time, but that's fine because it itself is an echo of the pen click that came before. That's funny, right? Subscribe for more high level humor. Pen clicking seems to be a thing in this show, as I also noticed Fring do this uh, pretty significant pen click. So anyways, the Kettleman's give in because they've sunk far enough in life, and just to use the carrot and stick language again, there's this broader carrot that Jimmy is using here in the plan. He's dangling the carrot of the Kettleman's having their reputation restored, a very large and tempting carrot. So they sign his letter of engagement. They had avoided Jimmy's self-interested assistance in season one so well that he simply brute forced himself into their life, but this time they take the bait. Jimmy and Kim get what they want. But do they? And before we wrap this up, let me ask, should I be calling him Saul here? So many people have commented on the earlier videos saying that I was wrong to say Jimmy changed his name to Saul because he's just changed his doing business as, not his name, and this is completely correct, but we should definitely not play down the significance of this professional name change anyway. He's not just changing the name of his business, he's creating a fictional identity. And I think we can agree that he's living in that identity when he's working as a lawyer. I mean, right? It's not clear, actually, since we hear exchanges like this. So Saul Goodman drives a brown Ford Taurus. Detroit calls that taupe, I believe. The fact that Kim refers to Saul demonstrates that he's not in the room right at that point, but the fact that Jimmy gets defensive about the car seems to show that he identifies with Saul in that moment. I'll say for myself, as I've made the previous videos, sometimes it's felt kind of strange and forced to refer to him by his legal fiction, so I didn't do it in this video, but once I tried it, I got used to it pretty fast in those previous videos, because his identities seem deeply intertwined. To be honest, I found it kind of cute that so many people commented to me saying that he's still named Jimmy, it kind of seems to show how viewers struggle with this process of seeing him change. Or maybe it just shows how Better Call Saul viewers love having a great attention to detail. So is he Saul Goodman in this scene where he's beginning this season 6 scam of the Kettleman's in his capacity as a lawyer? Were any of you watching and listening and getting annoyed that I kept calling him Jimmy? So anyways, when Betsy signs using Saul's back for support, she presses really hard. Come on. That's not... Ow. I don't know why I'm including this detail, but I loved it. Betsy and Craig are like if a snake and a turtle married each other and did accounting. Craig might be one of the funniest characters, besides, of course, Price, who we might need to do a whole video about. I don't know. Let me know what you think about that. I have a nephew named Price. I've always kind of liked that name. Anyways, the Kettlemans are fascinating, and Better Call Saul deeply requires this couple, as we start the whole show by seeing just how far Jimmy is willing to go to try to benefit off of them. His errors along the way are what sets off his entrance into the world of the Salamancas, after all, beginning everything. Rewatching season six, I got this strange feeling that Kim and Jimmy are some kind of twisted reflection of Betsy and Craig. Both couples find some weird type of self-absolution from response as all wrongdoers try to do, as the behavior's way of trying to maintain itself against a potential noise of a conscience. But Kim and Jimmy are definitely different from Betsy and Craig in many ways, one specifically being that Betsy and Craig want money, while Kim and Jimmy want money and power. Well, let's see how that works out for them. Oh, hey. I didn't see you there. Um... Thanks for watching. Wow, that was interesting, right? We really enjoyed that one. That was like a really good one, I think, uh, in some way. If you want to compensate me financially, if you want to give me money of almost any currency, there are a few ways you can do that. I've been a really good person and tried to make it really easy for people to give me money. 
So you can go on the Patreon, patreon.com slash what's therapy, and you can give some money there. Or you can give money via YouTube membership. Or if you're, you know, not a fan of these platforms, head on over to Twitch and you can subscribe and I'll get, um, I guess, a, a chunk of that money. And then obviously Jeff Bezos gets some of the money too, because he works really hard for that, okay? In my opinion, the Patreon is probably the best bang for your buck. I mean, I don't really try that hard to like give people any bang for the buck because, you know, I work like hundreds of hours on these videos. <laughs> But um, I do actually put a ton of extra content on the Patreon. Like, okay, for this video, I made a song that I'm putting on the Patreon and a music video where Craig Kettleman and Saul Goodman are like talking, but it's like, it goes to the beat and it's really cool and it's really funny. And I had a lot of fun making it. And so I'm always putting weird extra music and videos and stuff on the Patreon. YouTube memberships, there are like some cool benefits there too, for sure. And eventually I'll do YouTube uh, members only live streams when I get a sufficient number of members. But I am gonna be doing live streams on YouTube uh, really soon, starting this coming Monday before the next episode. I think I'm gonna do them weekly on Mondays before the new episode drops. So come hang out, even if you don't like Better Call Saul, we can talk about other stuff. I love it when people ask me about therapy, mental health, philosophy, things I don't know anything about. The whole point of streaming is to just talk and and say things and pretend like I know things and it's really fun and you can comment you can oh you can give me money there too you can super chat which is a way to give me more money so these, these are all fantastic and uh, but really thank you so much for watching and thank you so much to the amazing wonderful human beings that give me such support on patreon and YouTube memberships right now I'm gonna tell you tell you who these people are so you can get a feel for like the company you could be a part of, uh, company as in like um, other people, it, we're not like a literal company, but like the people you can be sort of in a community with if you uh, choose to either subscribe to the Patreon or YouTube memberships. So thank you so much. Thank you, okay? Thank you so much. I'll start with the patrons. Thank you to a cool anonymous person. Wait, let me make sure it's still recording. It keeps stopping recording. Yeah, okay, it's still recording. Thank you also to Elise. Thank you to Joe. Thank you to Strawman Productions. Thank you to Miles. Thank you to Lauren. Thank you to Max. Thank you to Magenta Lava Lamp. And I'm sorry if that's your real name and I'm doxing you. And I also know that I made that joke in the last video about a different patron. It's still kind of funny. Thank you to Luke. Thank you to Thulusaurus Rex. Thank you to Gunther. Big thank you to Adam M, who's giving me more money than even necessary. Like, you can give $1 or $4 as part of the Patreon, but some people, if they're just, like, flush with cash, they give me more than they even need to. So thank you very much, Adam. Thank you to Modest Maoist, which is probably the best type of Maoist to be. Uh, thank you to Boom. Thank you to Isaiah. And thank you to Hall's Balls. I really appreciate the support. Now over to the wonderful YouTube members, okay? So these YouTube members, not that type of member, the other type. These YouTube members, are they're very new. They jumped on the membership train as soon as it left the station, and I really appreciate that. I don't know if that metaphor makes sense because you probably get on the train before it leaves the station. But anyways, uh, thank you to Elias, Elias, I'm sorry. I feel like there's like a third way that name can be pronounced. I might have gotten it wrong in both ways. And thank you to Jaden. Thank you so much, y'all. So if you want to support the channel, you can do so in the ways I mentioned and enjoy some extra content, but mostly you're just uh, compensating me uh, and incentivizing me to continue doing this, which I'm going to keep doing this anyways, but it's just a way to incentivize me a little more. <laughs> I shouldn't be drinking coffee right now. I would never do it when I'm recording the main audio because it makes your mouth kind of sticky. But sometimes you just have to celebrate, you know, and live on the edge. So season six is gonna end soon. The show's gonna end soon. That, this is so exciting. I genuinely love this show. It's the best show that's probably ever existed. And I can say that definitively, despite what some commenters want to claim that I can't say that because I, don't know and I haven't even seen Breaking Bad, let alone a bunch of other shows. 
Uh, I don't care, you know, because my opinion uh, is still objectively true in the subjective universe of my mind, and that's a fact. Um, a nature fact. Please leave a comment on the video if you would like to and let me know what you thought, let me know how you feel about the video or about the show in general, and let's get excited for the end of this amazing show. I am so excited to watch the episode out on Monday and then every episode until the end. Subscribe, of course. I will have at least one more video about Better Call Saul. And what I might do is have one after season six, maybe two after season six, and then go on to talk about other stuff. And it's okay if you're not interested, but you know, give it a shot. Because if you like my style of analysis and I talk about something you've never heard of or seen, you know, give it a shot anyways uh, and see if maybe you'll find it interesting. But what I might do is like, you know, do one or two more videos right when season six ends about Better Call Saul, and then maybe just like in a year or two, you know, like do like a reflections or something. I don't know. The door is always open. Like I said, I could do a video all about price. I have a lot more to say, but I'll go through in my notes. I'll see what I have to say. And then of course, season six, the finale, it's gonna blow everything open and uh, there's gonna be a lot more to talk about. So please come to the YouTube live stream that we're gonna do on Monday and the ones we're gonna do in the future, either weekly, you know, probably weekly until the show ends and then maybe every few weeks after that. But I'm really looking forward to engaging with the community on YouTube and like talking and just like discussing stuff and having a good time. So thanks so much for watching all the way until the end, and I hope you have a really good rest of your day and rest of your week and uh, maybe month as well, if that's possible. And uh, see you soon. Bye. So a beat is bad. 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 So